This next song, my old church used to play this. And you may not be familiar with it, but I worship to him. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good. I will give thanks to the Lord for you are good. I will give thanks to the Lord for you are merciful. Lord, for you are good. You've been good all of my days, and I will give you praise. I will give thanks to the Lord, for you are good. I will give thanks to the Lord, for you are merciful. Lord, for you are good. You have been good all of my days, and I will give you praise. All my life I've needed you. And all my life I've needed you. Oh, oh. Someone who would love me. Take off all these chains To God of glory speak your word And I will give you praise I will give you praise I will give you praise Thanks to the Lord for you are good. I will give thanks to the Lord. You are merciful. I will give thanks to the Lord for you are good. You have been good all of my days, and I will give you. So my life I've needed you oh, Someone who would love me Take off all these chains To God of glory speak your word And I will give you praise I will give you I will give you praise. I will give you praise. I will give you praise. I will give you Let 
Christ alone that we worship that we live that we have strength that we have security and safety and salvation thank you Lord
firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. Christ I stand In Christ alone Who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless be This gift of love in righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, says Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ. Then in the ground his body lay, that of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Sin's curse is lost its grip on me For I am his and he is mine Bought with the precious blood of Christ is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns Calls me home here in the power of Christ. Yes. No power of hell, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever break me from his hand till he returns. Or oh, calls me home here in the power of Christ. I'll stand here in the power of Christ. I'll stand. Yes, Lord, we stand in you. God, thank you for being our refuge and our strong tower. Lord, thank you for, again, just loving us. <laughs> Lord, show us the depths of that love, God, the heights, the length, Lord, of that love. that we get to worship you, Lord, freely in spirit and in truth. Offer up the, the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, Lord, giving thanks to you continually. So bless us, Lord. Bless Jerry, Lord, as he shares your word, as he shares testimony, as he shares straight from you, God. So lead us today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Am I on? Great, thank you. I just want to brag for a moment that I got to hear Josh and Stephanie praise our Lord before any of the rest of you did, so I'm pretty happy about that. Thank you for having me. It's an honor and privilege to be here today. Uh, I'm, I'm here every week, usually, watching the door and, and making sure we're all okay and stuff like that, but, uh, 
but it's an honor to be standing here today. You know, uh, this, this is a message that the Lord gave me back in 2005, and we've been sharing it literally around the world since then, you know, in Asia, on airplanes, everywhere, and, and all over the place. Uh, we go up to Maine and share it every year, and, uh, and almost any time that somebody says, hey, can you, can you bring a message to us? I'm like, yeah, and I know exactly what that is, because this is the message that the Lord has brought on my heart to bring to people, so it makes it pretty easy. It's talking about uh, freedom. Freedom from, from bondage, freedom from lies, freedom from the things that bind us. And uh, for me, one of the things that bound me was alcoholism. And for those of you who don't know, I was a, an alcoholic. I don't mean just a little alcoholic, like eh, I had a little problem with it or something like that. I want you to understand the scale of this. That I would drink a fifth of bourbon every day. And every day I'd wake up and I'd go, go into PT and I'd PT hard and I'd work and everything like that. A completely functional alcoholic. But I'll tell you, I didn't have a problem, right? So I have this giant cup, about the same size as the cup you all see me carrying around that goes on my motorcycle and stuff like that. I had this big giant cup, and I'd pour half of that fifth into that thing, and I'd put some ice in there, and I'd put some, uh, some soda in there, and drink a bourbon and Coke. I'd drink that, that half of that. And then I'd do, refill it one more time that night, and I'd finish off that one, and I'd drink a fifth every single night, right? And I tell you that not to brag. I tell you that because any sane, rational person can look at that and say, man, that's a problem, Right? But that guy sitting in the middle of it would say, no, I don't have a problem. I drink two drinks a day, right? A, a complete, absolute lie, right? But that's where I was. And, uh, and the Lord brought me through this message. This is a message that I'll be sharing with you today. So talk about freedom. I think of this quote from uh, Lance Corporal Tim Kraft. He was in Quezon, Vietnam and, uh, back in the 60s. And he was in Quezon and uh, just a junior Marine. And a reporter came up to him and said, hey, if there's any message you could send back home, what would it be? And he said, freedom has a flavor that the protected, let me, let me read this for you. It says, for those who have fought for it, freedom has a taste the protected will never know. Right? So he's talking about like those who are forward, that are putting their lives in the hands of the men to their left and right, who are smelling the death, who are seeing and hearing the sounds of combat and stuff like that. For these guys, they've got this taste that the protected people will never know, will never understand. I believe there's some truth to that, right? I mean, there's got to be some truth to that. And I've been in combat, and I can understand some of that, and I've got to agree with the man a little bit. And then at the same time, I understand that there's a freedom that's far, far greater than our national freedom, right? It's not secured by men, right? It's secured by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the freedom that he brings, brings us far greater, far better flavor than that which we who have been in combat will understand. Some of you may have wrestled through this. If you've wrestled through it and you've gotten leaned on the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, you understand that that flavor is far, far better than the flavor that I talk about in combat. John 8, 35 says, If the Son has set you free, you're free indeed. And so we'll be talking a bit about freedom today. In the Marine Corps, I was a combat engineer. All right, I was an engineer officer specifically. Some people would look down at me for that. But I was a combat engineer. It's our job to focus on mobility, counter-mobility, survivability, general engineering. We, we help people move and we stop enemies and bad guys from moving towards us, right? We make things stronger, we build things up and stuff. But really, as I'm, I'm pushing the Baghdad and stuff, our job is to keep breaching through obstacles, through blowing things up to help us get to the enemy. And then occasionally, you're going to have to turn to defense. It'd be great if we could just push in the offense all the way to Baghdad and never have to stop once. But eventually, you're going to run out of materials. You're going to run out of supplies. You run out of fuel. You run out of ammo. You get tired. You get exhausted. You take too much of a beating, and you can no longer press forward in the offense. You've got to stop, and you've got to transition to the defense for a while, right? We call that our culminating point. We hit that culminating point, and we're going to establish a defense. We start establishing a perimeter around us, protective obstacles, right? Ideally, if I've got a, I'm doing a top-down view right here. This is my unit. I don't care what size it is, platoon, company, battalion, it's irrelevant. But I'm doing a top-down look on this thing. My unit is all inside of that circle there. Ideally, I would start at the max extent of my weapon systems, and I'd start building obstacles out there, and then I'd build closer and closer and closer to me. So I'm never on the far side of those obstacles too, right? That's what they teach us in practice and doctrine and stuff. The reality is I don't always have enough time and materials. I might not know how much time I have, and I certainly don't have enough materials that we're carrying along in those trucks and stuff. So in practice, we end up starting very, very close, and then over time, we're going to build further out, right? So at the very beginning of all this thing, these guys are establishing a defense. They're digging into the holes and stuff, and our engineers are going to work. We're analyzing the terrain out there, and we start putting up our first protective obstacle. It's called protective wire. Can you bring up the picture, please, Chris? Protective wire. 
we're just going to kind of trace the defense a little bit, trace the shape of the terrain, and we're going to make this protective wire that's made out of triple strand concertina wire. That poor guy is stuck pretty good in this stuff. You might call it razor wire if you've never had any experience with this. All right? We make the triple standard concertina wire out of two coils, two big coils of that razor wire right there, and then a third one on top of it. And then it's tied together with stakes and it's tied together with barbed wire and with twine and stuff like that. We, this is a formidable obstacle. Very, very difficult for dismounted troops to come through this. Even very, very difficult for vehicles to come through this, right? And so we build that all around our defense. And then we start camouflaging it. Okay, this is just outside of hand grenade range. And if the enemy ever gets through this thing, man, we're fixing bayonets. This is when you're coming to the most grotesque combat known to man. We're going hand to hand and we're, we're just in a, a mass of violence and destruction right now, right? We're going to camouflage everything because camouflage is continuous. Time goes on, you get more time, more resources, and we start building this more. We start analyzing the avenues of approach. We look at the way that an enemy might come close to me, and I start crossing those areas, those avenues of approach, with it more of this wire, more, more triple strand, but now we call it tactical wire because it's got a different purpose. All right, so the tactical wire crosses over those avenues of approach, and then we also are going to lay down machine guns on those things, on every single one of these things, so now, an approaching enemy, as he's coming up to those avenues of approach, he's trying to get through those things, we're also directly counterattacking that guy with machine guns. All right? Going to continue to camouflage, and then as time continues to go on, we're going to keep building on this thing, and we put in the next layer, and that's called supplementary wire. So supplementary wire branches off of these. Just branches off of the tactical wires. It could branch off of the uh, protective as well. It doesn't really matter. The whole point is to distract, deceive, disorient. The point is to break up the shape of the offense, to make it very, of the defense, to make it very, very difficult for an approaching enemy to come towards, for him to, to, to approach us, right? So now he's just got this big mess of him that's not only confusing as he looks in from the outside, but it's also camouflaged, right? This is a, a really difficult for, de defense for somebody to penetrate. And this is the kind of defense I would help build in combat. You have an enemy of your soul. The word says he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's 1 Peter 5, 8. Jesus said he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. His goals are to steal, kill, and destroy. I believe he wants to steal your joy far more than your possessions. I believe he wants to kill your soul far more than your body. And I believe he wants to destroy everything that you hold dear. Jobs, relationships, families, churches, marriages. He wants to absolutely destroy every single bit of it. Jesus is talking to him. He's talking to the Pharisees in John chapter 8. They're talking to Jesus, and they're, oh, well, we're sons of Abraham. We're not slaves. We're free men, so on and so forth, right? Going a little bit back and forth on this. And Jesus says to him, if God were your father, you would love me, for I've come here from God. I've not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He is a liar and the father of lies. And just as I built defenses like this for the infantry as we were pushing forward to Baghdad, the enemy of your soul will help you build a defense like this right around your heart. And he does so in lies. And it starts like this, typically. I'm young, vulnerable. I have a difficult time internalizing things and understanding things. And somebody who loves me or is supposed to love me hurts me tremendously. They rock my soul. And the enemy of your soul is right there to tell you, there's no such thing as love. There's no such thing as true love. There's no such thing as unfailing love. Maybe he turns it and points at you. Look at you. You're so bad. You're disgusting. You're so bad. Nobody could possibly love you, right? I don't look at this as a defense. I feel bad, right? I feel disgusted by this. But I start to believe it, and the very next time that somebody else hurts me, somebody who loves me or is supposed to love me, wounds me badly, I say, of course, because there's no such thing as true love. 
Of course, because there's no such thing as unfailing love, or nobody could love me. Look at me. Of course they would do this again to me, right? Of course yet another person is going to leave me. Yet another person is going to abuse me. Because nobody could possibly love me, right? Now, that next thing seems to hurt less. And because it seems to hurt less, that, simple, that, that beginning lie, that foundational lie, is firmly in place in my heart. And I start to believe that thing, and I start to embrace that thing. And then I build up a big defense around that thing based in lies that I believe is going to protect me and I will hang on to with my life. Why love? Why did I focus so much on love on that central lie? Because 1 John tells us that God is love. God is love, and it says it twice in 1 John. I believe it's 4, 8 and 4, 16. Yeah, I actually remembered it from the notes. 4, 8 and 4, 16. It tells us that God is love. So if the enemy can shake our faith in love, he can shake our faith in God. Now, if I'm a believer, my faith is weak, it's impotent. I can't really carry out the desires of our Lord, right? Because I've always got this thing in the back of my mind. Does he really love me? Does he really have my best interests in my heart? Can I really trust him to take me where he wants to take me? Right? I have these doubts. If I'm not a believer, how difficult is it for me to come to the Lord? We've all heard unbelievers talk, right? Right? And the unbeliever says, how could a good and loving God allow? Blank. Right? They look at the most difficult situations in the world, the most challenging situations. How could a good and loving God allow? And the essence of what they're saying is there's no such thing as love. There's no loving God. No loving God would allow that terrible thing to happen to that kid. No loving God would allow people to starve to death in wherever. Right? So therefore, there can't be a good and loving God. And they refuse to believe in Him. The enemy's work was done long ago in that heart. Well before they ever saw that situation. Right? So that lies in place. And now it looks like this. We've got this big defense built up, and we're empty still, right? I'm empty because man desires unfailing love. Proverbs 19.22 says, Man desires unfailing love. And I'm telling you, we will do anything to try and find this. We join fraternities and sororities in colleges. You get around the college crowd, they'll hang on to a fraternity or sorority for life. Like, I mean, it is, it is life for them, right? You get around street gangs, it's the same way. Motorcycle clubs are the same way. They all have these codes that you will never, never turn your back on your brother. You always help a brother in need or a sister in need if you're in the sorority, right? We're looking for that thing that's going to bring us unfailing love. That thing that's never going to let us down. That thing that's always going to be there for us. The Marine Corps has a motto, Semper Fidelis right? Always faithful. Always faithful as though any man could ever be unfailingly faithful. And we're looking for these things everywhere except for our Lord Jesus Christ. And all of these things will all fail us because they're all based in man. But we try to camouflage this with those. We've got that emptiness, right? That emptiness of not fully believing in love, and we try and fill that void with anything. And when those things don't work, we continue to try and cover this up and camouflage that whole thing, that whole pain that we have, and we'll camouflage it with anything. We camouflage it with sex because that just gives me that good, warm feeling and stuff like that. I got some, I got some, some love going on, right? We camouflage it with drugs. I can't tell you how many heroin addicts I've heard talk about how, man, it felt like love. It felt like love. I just felt so, ah, oh, everything was good. There was nothing wrong in the world, right? We camouflage it with alcohol. We camouflage it with performance, right? If I perform and I look good and everybody looks at me and they're like, man, what a great guy. And they're giving me all those compliments. What am I looking for? I'm looking for admiration. I'm looking for respect. I'm looking for love, right? So we camouflage this in any way that we can to try and cover up for that thing that's still causing emptiness inside of us. And then we'll hang on to those things for our life. Those very things that could be destroying us, destroying our marriages, destroying everything around us, and we hang on to those things for life. So it looks like this. The person comes and they start bringing us this problem. They start talking to us about this whole defense and all that camouflage, and they first run into that first line out there, right? We said that was supplementary wire. And the whole purpose of that stuff was to distract, deceive, disorient, kind of put anywhere else except for me, right? So they run into that stuff. Jerry, man, you are an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic. What are you talking about? I get up every day and I go to work. I can run five miles every single morning and be fine at 5 a.m. I'm not an alcoholic. I perform. I work every single day. I'm paying all my bills. I'm taking care of my kids. I'm not an alcoholic. Hey, look at that homeless guy over there. 
That guy who's robbing to feed his habit. That guy who's not paying his child support. That guy who's not taking care of things because his problem. That guy's got a problem. I don't have a problem. Right? All those things may be rooted in truth, right? But they're all lies because they're all saying, I don't have a problem when I know very well I've got a problem. They get any further, we said they run into that tactical wire, right? Where we got the machine guns. Now we're actually counterattacking people, man. We're, we're really pointing back at them. We get, Jerry, really, seriously, you need help. Like, I don't need help. What about you, you stinking hypocrite? You got blah, 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 blah. And we start actually attacking all the people who love us and are trying to help us. All right? And they get any closer, and we start fixing bayonets. I have an explosion of violence. I'm ready to destroy everything that is near me if I think I'm going to protect my heart. I'm willing to destroy relationships. Sometimes physical violence, right? Sometimes a relationship, relational violence. I'm willing to destroy the very things that are most dear in my life if it means I think I'm going to protect myself. And this thing is a prison. It's like that Marine caught inside of the wire up there. This whole thing is a prison. I think it's going to protect me. I've built it up to protect me. And it's a prison. We find ourselves in this pattern of destructive behavior we, get, we can't get out of. I'm stuck inside of this thing, and I can't even see clearly past it because of all the camouflage and everything else. So how do I get out of this? Well, this whole thing is rooted in lies. If this whole thing is rooted in lies, then the freedom from this comes in truth. And truth has tremendous power. First, it's the genesis for change. If you look back in the first five chapters of Leviticus, you're going to see first five sacrifices, the five sacrifices that we're talking about inside of the law. You got the burnt offering, you got the grain offering, you got the fellowship offering, and then you got the sin and the guilt offering. And the burnt offering, the entire sacrifice is put up on the altar. It's like Romans 12, 1, right? Talking about being up on the altar is a living sacrifice, right? The whole burnt offering is put up on the altar. And it's a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It serves nobody else. The second, the grain offering, a memorial portion goes on the altar and is burned up. It's a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And then the rest of it goes to the priests. And then we got the fellowship offering. And the memorial portion of that goes onto the altar. It's burned up and it's a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And then it goes to everybody else around us. And this is our pattern of worship. Because first, we're wholly consumed, completely dedicated in our service to the Lord. Second, we're furthering the kingdom. We're enabling the work of the kingdom. And third, we're serving our brothers around us. That's a pretty good pattern of worship, right? But we suck at that, so we get the sin and the guilt offering. <laughs> and the sin and the guilt offering talk about how we can make amends, how we can make restitution, how we can make reconciliation with our Lord and with our brothers around us. When I've wronged one of them, how can I fix this situation? It gives you some pretty good patterns for this. I get that it's Old Testament law. It still gives you some really good patterns for reconciling relationships inside of here. One of the first things, though, is truth. It never even begins. You never begin the sin or guilt offering until you first acknowledge that, man, I really screwed this up. Man, I've got a problem. Every 12-step organization in the world has taken this on as their thing, right? Like, hey, Nothing changes. Nothing changes until you first admit that you've got a problem. They all recognize this because they all stole it straight from the word. So truth is the genesis for change. Truth is also how we stand firm. Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God. Right? And the first element of it is the belt of truth. Gird your loins with the belt of truth, it says to us. Right? Gird your loins with the belt of truth so that you don't fall for the enemy's schemes. Right? We don't fall for his attacks and his fiery arrows anymore. That's why we're putting on the armor, so we don't fall for his attacks anymore. And the first element of that is the truth. Know the truth, you don't fall for the lies. So, we've got the genesis for change, we've got the power to stand firm. Our Lord says the truth sets you free. And finally, the Word says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by Him. It's the power for salvation. So all this power is wrapped up in truth. And we use that truth then... To destroy these lies. Psalm 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. 
If you don't write any other verse down today, write Psalm 147.3 down. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And think about the tense of this. It didn't say he healed the brokenhearted, like it was something that happened maybe in the Old Testament, but doesn't happen anymore for those people who believe that miracles used to happen, but don't happen anymore. No, it doesn't say that. He heals the brokenhearted. Or maybe you think, oh, well, you know, he'll heal us someday. You know, when we see him face to face, then I'll be fully healed, right? When we get that perfect body and everything, and that, that he, he, he'll heal us then. No, man, he heals today. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And I'm telling you that this is an issue of brokenheartedness. If nothing else, this is an issue of brokenheartedness, and our Lord has healing for you today. And it starts with truth. First, we've got to recognize the sin. We've got to recognize the addiction. We've got to recognize the patterns of lies in our heart that have driven us to this thing, through which, the lens through which, I can't actually see an honest picture of the world or the situations around me. If I look at everything through the lens of the lies that I came to believe in, nothing is clear. Right? So I've got to start asking the Lord to tear this stuff down. And I'm telling you, if you've got that camouflage in your life, if you've got that great sin issue, you've got that addiction, you've got that thing of drivenness that you hang on to to give you some fulfillment, that's got to be the first thing to go. If it's drugs, if it's alcohol, if it's something else that just covers up everything else, maybe it's focused on video games forever, maybe it's running marathons. We've heard Greg's friend about this several times, man. He got rid of his alcoholism and just transitioned to being addicted to marathons, addicted to running, and started running ultra marathons. And that was the thing that covered up everything, right? You got that thing that's unhealthy in your life, that's taking away from everything, that's covering up everything. That's the first thing that's got to go because you will never see the rest of the lies until you get that thing out of your life. Until you get that camouflage out. And then we start allowing the Lord to tear this stuff down. To lie by a lie, tear this stuff down. We look at Psalm 139, 23, 24. I'm going to go there. I'm one of those phone Bible people. I, I also have this one because I know where everything is in this one. I've been using it for a lot of years. And, and like I just flipped to a page and the thing is right there. And my problem is that this, the, the, it started shrinking, right? The, the book started getting smaller on me, and so I have a hard time. So sometimes I keep it around so I can really quickly flip to the page and know what verse I'm looking for, and then I can actually go to here and read it where it's the right size. Some of you might have that problem too. All right, so Psalm... 139, 23 and 24. Many of you probably haven't memorized Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any way offensive in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Would we say that this is an offensive way? If I've got a heart that's surrounded by lies that I'm hanging on to that I think are protecting me and that's the lens at which I I look at the whole world, is that an offensive way to the Lord? I'd say. I'd say, but this isn't just me saying, right? I don't want to base this on opinion. Like, we look at homosexuality in the church, and we talk about it's, it's an abomination unto the Lord. It's a terrible, detestable thing. It is. I'm not going to downplay the sin, right? That's what the Lord says about the sin, okay? Now let's put it in context. You know what else the Lord says about lying lips? Lying lips are an abomination. That's how abhorrent God thinks this is. I'm hanging on to these lies in my heart, and God's like, that is an abomination. That thing is destroying you, and it's destroying everybody around you. And I want that gone, and I want to heal your brokenheartedness, but you've got to let that go. So Psalm 139, 23, 24, we beg the Lord to search our heart. And I don't mean like, oh, Lord, show me my heart. I mean get on your knees and pray. I mean stay there. I mean still and quiet yourself before the Lord and wait for Him to show you and then listen to Him. He's like, you believe this. And you're like, no, no, Lord, that's ridiculous. I don't believe that because your word says this. I don't believe that. And he's like, no, man, in your heart, this is what you believe. And I'm telling you, write those things down. When the Lord starts showing you those offensive things that you believe inside of your heart, you write those things down. And then you search the scriptures and you beg the Holy Spirit to show you which scriptures it is that that, that directly contradicts those things. And you hang on to those. And I write them on note cards. And I put them in the back of my pocket and I go throughout the day and I just keep pulling them out. Keep memorizing. Keep memorizing. And put it back in my pocket. And pull it back out. 
and keep memorizing these things. Keep looking at these things. And I hang on to one that says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All right? And I got these lies that are telling me nobody can possibly love you and stuff. And God's saying, while you were at your worst, while you're yet sinners, my son was willing to die for you. While you were my enemy, my son was willing to die for you. That's how much he loves me. And I'm thinking I'm unlovable, and God's saying, absolutely not. While you were unlovable, while you were at your most unlovable, your most detestable, our righteousness, my very, very best, the word says about my righteousness that it says filthy rags. And we all understand the context of that. It's like filthy menstrual rags. That's how filthy. Not just like, huh, a rag in my garage that I'm going to pick up and use again, right? Filthy. That's my righteousness. That's how good I am by myself. And at that point, the Lord says, I loved you so much that I would die for you. And I hang on to that scripture, man. I keep memorizing that scripture. And I keep looking at that thing and I put it back into my heart. I put it back into my pocket. I pull it out so many times a day and I focus on this thing and I ask the Lord to just show me this in my heart and in my mind and to change my heart and to change my mind. And how does the word say that we become new, trans, new, new creations? How are we transformed and turned into something different? We're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I keep focusing on these things until my mind is no longer corrupted by the patterns of this. And my mind sees truth. And something horrible happens to me, and my mind no longer says, of course this happened to you. Nobody could possibly love you. My mind says, man, this happened and this is horrible. But I know my Lord is here with me. I know he can empathize with me in this. I know he loves me through this. And I am a new man. And I am freed from this. You say to me, but Jerry, it isn't my fault. You don't understand what they did to me. You don't understand where these lies came from when I was such a kid. The abuse that I had and everything, and you're right, I don't. I absolutely don't. Nor does anybody else know your unique situation, except for the Lord our God. Hebrews 4.15 says that he can empathize with you. He suffered all the way unto death. He never sinned. He never deserved anything. And it says, we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are, and yet he did not sin. And he suffered far worse than you did because he suffered all the way to his death completely undeservingly. He knows your pain. He sits at the right hand of the Father, and he is prepared to heal your broken heart today. And I've been a long-time alcoholic, and cherish many of you, know her, have been pressing me on this for a long, long time, and I just kept ignoring it. And the Lord took me away for a while. I went to Iraq in uh, OIF-1. And uh, as I went there, of course, you don't have any alcohol there. You're, you're stuck, and you're going clean and stuff like that, just uh, uh, not even choosing. Because we're there we're working an ordinance mission. And uh, I've got my platoon working this thing. We're blowing up all the ordnance that we can find, man. We're taking eight truckloads of ordnance out into the desert, and we're making ponds in the desert because the explosions are so big, you know. And uh, eventually we come to a place where I need additional manpower, manpower, and we hire some Iraqis to work along with us, truckers and laborers. And, uh, and I think that if something's going to go wrong, it's probably going to go wrong with the Iraqis, you know. So I pull all the platoon over to the side, and I have the gunny watching those guys, and I keep me and one other guy there with the Iraqis. And... Uh, our guys are taking some ordnance that we think we're going to be able to store, that we think we're going to be able to turn over to the new Iraqi army, and they're taking it over and they're putting it inside of bunkers so that we can store this stuff and seal the bunkers shut and then give it to the Iraqis later on. And I'm about 100 meters away or so, and I'm talking to the Iraqi, the truck driver, through my interpreter and stuff, and we're just standing there, and I'm kind of watching off in the distance. I'm watching these guys work right here and stuff and just, just, just seeing the whole situation. And the Humvee pulls up to the bunker that they're going to put the stuff into, that they're going to secure everything inside of. And as it pulls up there, it turns around, stops. One of the Marines gets out, and they start going to look inside and make sure that everything is clear. And as he starts to go in, gets inside of that thing, I see a fire start over there. It starts very close to the Humvee. See the three Marines in the back of the Humvee just got a little careless that day. They were smoking cigarettes. And they got over there. And I don't mind that they smoke cigarettes. We actually told them, I know that you're not used to working with the ordnance inside of an ammunition support place. I mean, we, we get that, right? 
but go, go take a smoke break. I don't want anybody sneaking. And they, they did pretty good with that. In this case, they just got a little bit careless inside of the vehicle. And so one of the guys gets out, pitches a cigarette butt, goes inside of the bunker, and this fire starts. And the fire starts behind him. And this fire starts erupting and everything like that. And I just stop everybody from talking and everything. I'm not talking to the turp anymore. I'm not talking to the truck driver. There's, there's a situation over here, you know? And I start watching this thing closely. And that thing erupts. And it sounds like a dragon is the, is the, the propellant. There's propellant that was dumped out everywhere out of canisters and stuff, right? It's like gunpowder dumped out everywhere so that they could scrap the, the canisters. And so it's everywhere. And that stuff is what's burning up. And as that stuff goes up, it sounds like a dragon is erupting out of this bunker. It's just flames are flying from every vent and stuff like that. Huge flames out the door. And it just is rumbling. And I see the Humvee come flying out of those flames. Right? And the tarp is burned up and stuff. And the Marines, all their gear would be singed and burned up and everything. I'm like, oh, thank God they made it. And the bus is up there by the bunker. The Iraqis bus is their livelihood. So I go running up to that thing. I grab the bus. I drive it back to the Iraqis and I give it to them. And I get back into my Humvee, my driver, and my platoon sergeant's on the radio. And he says, one of them didn't get out. So what do you mean one of them didn't get out? Who? Clybecker. Clybecker didn't get out. I turn around, man. We go back over there. We drive. We park right by the bunker. And I get out and I tell Goff to stay there. And he's a good Marine. He didn't stay there. He's like, he's not leaving me alone. And I tell him to stay there. And I go running up to this bunker. And I get maybe halfway to this thing, and I'm looking at the door of this thing. I'm seeing the flames inside, and everything is still erupting, and I'm trying to step forward. And I can't will myself to take another step forward. Like, completely helpless, completely powerless. I can't physically step. And the thing starts to blow up, and the ordinance comes out, and the frag goes past us, and it frags the vehicle behind us, and I turn around, run back to the vehicle, and I run right over Goff. Dang it, man, I told you to stay there. We get up, we go in the vehicle, we get out of there. I get everybody back, we get accountability and stuff, call this thing in, and I'm angry. And the battalion commander shows up later, and he walks with me up there. We get as close as we can, and then we low crawl all the way up to this thing where this huge crater is. We're trying to see if we can see anything or do anything, and there's nothing. Nothing can be done. And we get back away from the bunker, and he's talking to me. It's just him and me alone, and I'm talking there, and I've got tears streaming down my face. Of course, I'm sad, right? Of course, I'm frustrated. I never wanted to lose a Marine in combat, right? Or in any other thing, an accident or anything like that. And here we are. But the one defining emotion really that's overtaking me is anger. Just anger. I'm so mad and I can't even understand why, but I'm just overwhelmingly mad. And we get home a long time later. It took us five days to get his body out. We did get his body out. We got it back to his parents and it was burned. It was grotesque. It was like nothing. The dog tags were completely gone. That's how badly burned this was. And as we pulled the body out from the bunker, working with the mortuary affairs guys, the uh, leg was badly broken too, and it just came apart. The flesh started coming apart. And six months or so after I'm home, I think it's a good idea to watch We Were Soldiers. And I'm sitting in my living room, I'm watching We Were Soldiers with my wife. And they get to the scene out in the LZ there where, where a soldier has his arm so badly burned that when they grab him, the flesh comes apart like that. And I see that, and it's turned into a sobbing, slobbery, can't breathe mess in my living room. It's not coming out of me. I'm just, and everything is back. All these emotions are back, and I'm still angry, and I've been angry forever, right? And Cherish is over there trying to hug me and stuff. <laughs> Touch me? I feel disgusted. I feel angry. I feel for sure less than a man and not worthy of love. And I knew that this was deep. And I'd been completely in rebellion to our Lord. I'd been walking as a prodigal for a very, very long time. And I'm still drunk right at that moment. But I knew that this was a deep and spiritual issue. And I started to seek the Lord in this and thank the Him. Thank the Lord that He was kind to me. And He spoke to me. And he says, you need to go back there. And I'm standing at that bunker and I'm looking at this and I can't take a step forward. And I'm remembering the basic school, right? They train officers and stuff, right? It's a little bit, a little bit different than, uh, than boot camp. We want initiative in boot camp and stuff. Like We train you for that. We train you to be an action-oriented guy. But man, as an officer, bias for action, lieutenant. Bias for action, lieutenant. You make a decision right now based on the situation that you see, the details that you see, and you execute that with violence of action now, and you will positively impact the situation. 
And that's how we train lieutenants. And that's what we need out of these guys who are going to be action-oriented men who are going to very quickly and rapidly lead in combat and stuff, right? You will impact the situation. I find myself there and I can't take a step forward. And I can't impact anything, man. I am completely powerless and I'm ruined. I'm worthless as a leader. I'm worthless as a man. I'm absolutely ruined. And the Lord says, hey, check this out. There is only one who is all-powerful in every situation, and it ain't you. I'm like, huh. I have put myself in the place of God. I have somehow convinced myself that I will always be able to positively impact this situation forever. Bias for action, Lieutenant, I can do it. I am all-powerful. Are you kidding me? This is what I've taken on in my heart. And when I can't actually change something, when I'm powerless to do so, the enemy's like, I told you so. Look at you. You're no good. You're absolutely worthless. You're not a leader. You're not a man. You're nothing. And I'm like, of course. Yeah, man, I, I believe that. And it was destroying me. And when I took on that truth, I'm like, man, the first thing that I needed to do was put God on the throne in my life. Number one, as the powerful being in my life. And I wish I could say that that was the end of the story right there and everything was good, but it wasn't, right? That had an impact on my life, tremendous impact on my life, and I continued to drink. And I continued to be a drunk. And Cherish continued to pray for me, and she continued to try and minister to me. And eventually we got to a point where you read 1 Corinthians 5, and it's talking about, I'm not saying that you'd have to leave, uh, you don't, don't interact with people of the world who do these things. If you did that, you'd have to leave the whole world. But I'm saying, if a man claims to be a believer and is, and like the first thing is, a drunkard, with such a man do not even eat. And Cherish is like, you need help. You need help. You're a danger to our family. I was abusive, not in the physically abusive way. I wasn't punching the kids or anything like that, but I was physically abusive. I was manipulative, like virtually everybody who's got a problem is. Right? Because I'm going to protect me. I'm going to protect this thing. And she keeps pressing this issue and keeps pressing this issue and stuff like that. And finally, I leave the house for a week. I'll leave for a week, but I'm coming back. And once I'm out of the house, it's like the, the Lord is just keeping me from coming back. Right? I just can't get back in the house. But I keep calling her and we keep talking on the phone and I keep twisting things and I keep manipulating her. And I keep pushing her until after about several months, she's like, I have no idea if I'm doing the right thing. I don't know if I made the right decision. I don't know if the Lord is leading this. I don't know anything. I don't know if this is right. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm calling Pastor Greg. I had not been going to church for so many years. Right? I'm, I'm calling Pastor Greg. She's like, don't call Pastor Greg. Too bad I'm calling Pastor Greg. And so I get on the phone with this guy, man, and I'm going to have him on his heels, right? She doesn't even know if she's making the right decision or not. She doesn't know if the Lord's leading this. All of you have put me out of the house, and I'm the victim here, and she doesn't know if she's doing the right thing. And I get on the phone with him, and I explain all this stuff, and he goes, man, Jerry, you're right, this is confusing, and this confusion is not good, and it's not of God. We need to get together and pray. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's right. We'll get together and pray. You know, thinking he's going to be on his heels. And he's like, yeah, let's come together. Whoa, that was not what I expected at all, right? Well, okay, yeah, that's right. We're going to get together and pray. And so I prepped for this thing. We set up a meeting a week from that point. And uh, I, I have two pages, notebook paper, front and back, right, of notes of how I'm going to tell all these people how screwed up they are, how big a hypocrites they are, Bible verses to slam them with and everything else, right? I'm going to beat them with the two by four of the Bible about how you all are wrong and I'm the victim here. Poor me, right? And I prep for this thing and we go in there and I'm ready for combat. And we had Greg and his wife and Cherish and a wife that was a, a, a family friend who was very familiar with our situation. And we get into that room and Pastor Greg opens in prayer, and I am struck, man. I am like Paul. I've been knocked off of my horse and blind. I'm like, I don't know anything anymore except for that I am wrong and he is Lord. And I'm holding these two pages of notes to tell everybody how they're all screwed up and I'm the victim. And God's like, you're not the victim in this, man. You're, not the, you're the wrong guy in this. It doesn't matter if anybody else did anything else wrong along this whole way. You were the one who's wrong here. And I got these two papers. I'm ashamed to even be holding these things. And I'm crumbling up into my hand until I can make this little tiny ball that I hope that I, if I could eat it, I would eat the thing. 
Please don't let anybody see this. I'm ashamed. And thank God nobody has. Oh, by the way, what did you have in your hand? I didn't have. No embarrassment there. God saved me some shame that day, right? And I crumbled these things up, and they get done. And do we want to talk about anything? I'm like, I got, I got nothing to talk about. I'm wrong. I need help. I know that I'm, I'm wrong, and I need help. And that was it. It was it. I couldn't argue with anything. I couldn't play the victim. I couldn't manipulate anybody. I couldn't twist anything. All I could do was say, God, I'm wrong and I need help. And praise God for that day. And that would be the beginning of the work that I would do over the next several months. And Greg started talking about, man, have you ever heard of like spiritual or emotional healing? You know, that, that sometimes we have these wounds that bind us up. These, these wounds that just... Very often times when we're young, they, they just put us in prison, right? And everything we see is askew and stuff like that. And we have a very hard time living a normal life and functioning normally, and especially a good spiritual life, right? Because we're looking at the world through these crazy lenses, you know? And I was like, man, I knew at that moment, I was like, I need this. I absolutely need this. I hear what you're talking about, and I know that I need this. He's like, yeah, I'll see if I can get you a workbook, so on and so forth. I'm like, workbook? No, man, I mean, I need this now. And I start seeking the Lord. I'm, I'm looking on the internet desperate for something. And I do find resources that are going to help with this. And they show me this thing, basically what I've talked through right here, right? Different pictures, different tools, different talk, and everything like that. But it was all based on the Word. And it was all based on the enemy of your soul, driving these lies around your heart, and the Lord freeing you through truth. And I start seeking the Lord on this because I need this, and I know I need this now. And he's making a difference. And he's showing me these things in my heart. And one of the first things he says is, you need to forgive your stepfather. I'm like, whoa, 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 that's not why we're here today, Lord. Uh, I'll just remind you, I was here because alcoholism, stuff like that. Uh, we don't need to talk about that. And he's like, you need to forgive your stepfather. I'm like, my stepfather. My mom and my dad divorced when I was very young, toddler. Because I, I can't remember an age of them being married. I was that young. Mom had married a stepdad. He was very abusive. She did not know about that. Uh, when she did find out about it, she told the man he needed to get help, and he refused, and he was asked to leave the house. That was after many, many years. He was very, very nice to her, you know, so she couldn't understand, couldn't believe that this guy could actually be an abusive person until she had witnessed it for herself, you know. And I was terrified from this guy from my earliest age. Like, from the earliest age I can remember, I would... I, hang on to her leg behind her leg if he's in the room just scared to death of this guy i'm four years old and very shortly after my fourth birthday party i had a bionic man most of you have no idea what that is i had the six million dollar man action figure that i had just gotten for my fourth birthday and this is my favorite toy and my stepbrother's over he's a year older than me he's over there and we're playing we're playing war like young boys do right and irritated back and forth and playing like kids do and no, I'm not to, don't tell you know i don't want to play with a ronald mcdonald that's all we had well here play with my bionic man anything to keep the peace please play with my bionic man you know i just don't talk to that guy scared to death of that guy let's keep peace here right let's be good kids take my bionic man and he takes that thing, and we continue to play, and he gets irritated again. And that's it, I'm going to dad. I'm like, oh, no. And he goes into his dad, and I don't even remember what any of this was about. It's just, just kids, just silly kids play, right? But I was genuinely trying to be such a good kid to this guy, right? And he goes in, and he tells his stepdad, and his stepdad brings me into the dining room, and he sits me up on the table, and he punches me in the head. And I fall backwards. And he makes me crawl back to the edge of the table and sit up, and he punches me in the head. And I fall backwards. And he makes me crawl back up. And I sit up. And he punches me in the head. And I don't know how long this goes on. But it goes on a lot. And I just keep getting knocked down. And I'm bawling. And I'm terrified of this guy. Right? And I'm like, even when I'm trying to be good, I'm just bad. And the enemy's there to say, no one can love you. Look at you. You're trying so hard to be good. And you're just bad. And that lie would color everything that I believed for the rest of my life. And somebody would leave, and somebody would hurt me, and somebody would do something. I'd say, of course. Of course, because. And what do we think of my faith? My faith was impotent, right? Just like I've talked about. Even though I was saved as a young man at 10 years old, I firmly believe that I walked out in prodigalism for a very, very long time, allowing myself to see the world through those lies. And the Lord's like, I've got freedom for you.
the Lord says, you've got to forgive that guy. And I'm like, pray for him. Bless those who persecute him, you, right? Pray for your enemies. And I'm like, all right, Lord, don't let him die a miserable death today. If you could spare him for one day, that's as much prayer as I can give you. That's as much goodness as I can give you, as much blessingness as I can give you on this guy. Just spare his miserable life for one day. And that's as much as I could get out initially. And that would probably remain my prayer for a little while. You know, over time it started to grow and it started to build. And before you know it, I'm seeing empathy for this guy. And I'm having sympathy for this guy. And I start to recognize that, man, this is a wounded man. This is a man who needs the love of my Savior. This is a man who needs the same healing from brokenheartedness that I need. And I start looking for this guy. I had been looking for this guy for my entire adult life. Right? I get into the Marine Corps, and like, I've been a scholarship wrestler. I'm a Marine now. I'm a tough guy. And I want to find this guy. And some days if I find him, I'm going to call him really, really bad names. Right? That I won't say in here for you. And other days, if I find him, I would kill him. I would kill that man if I found him that day. And Cherish and I used to go up to Ohio. Every time we had a long weekend, we'd be down here stationed at Lejeune, and we'd go up to Ohio, and we'd cruise around there to see all of our family and stuff. And I knew he had moved back to Ohio after my mom and him had gotten divorced. And we'd stop at a gas station, and I'd go to the phone booth. They had phone booths back then, guys, young kids. They had phone booths. There's a, a box that you'd go to that had a phone in it, and you'd pick that thing up. I'd go to the phone booth, and I'd pick up the phone book, which also doesn't really exist today, and I'd start looking for this guy's name because I still remembered it. And I'd look up, nope, not in this town. And I'd put that book down and I'd go away. And I head to the next town, right? And I get over there and I look, oh, not here either. I can't even find this name anywhere as we travel around Ohio. I've searched around for this guy. I've tried to call some people. I can't find this guy anywhere, right? 2005, now the Lord's leading me to bring this man, our Savior. And I start looking for him and I immediately find some relation. I don't find him. I find my stepbrother. And I call this guy up. I was like, man, hey, Steve, Jerry Raider, man, we were stepbrothers so many years ago. He's like, holy cow, wow, great to hear from you, you know. And we talk family and life and small talk and careers and what are you doing? That guy's a social worker helping abused kids now. Imagine that. And so we talked for a little while and I said, hey, man, uh, I got to ask you, uh, I'm really trying to find your dad. Would you have contact information for him? And he says, oh, Jerry, I'm sorry to tell you, man. Uh, my dad passed away in 1990. 1990! This is 2005! This man has been dead for 15 years, and for my entire adult life, I've been chasing around this dead man to sometimes call him bad names and to sometimes kill him. 15 years I've been chasing a ghost, right? Who did this have any impact on? Who did this bitterness and this unforgiveness hurt? Was it the product of my bitterness or unforgiveness? Heck no, that dude's in the grave. It didn't do anything to him. But it hurt me, and it hurt my family, and it hurt everybody around me that I was not dedicating myself to that I should have been. And that's where this takes you. This destroys you. It does nothing to anybody else except for those close to you who you're now wounding because of this. But those products of your wounds, those guys aren't getting hurt. You're not getting any revenge on them by this stuff. Nor should you want to. But our Lord frees you from this. Our Lord is still sitting at the right hand of your Father. He has still bled out completely for you. He still has empathy for you. And He is still prepared to heal your broken heart today. If you've not made that first step, if you've not made that first step of putting the Lord on the throne of your life, and it's important, I encourage you to pick that up today, to clean that up today, and we will have people sitting in these chairs. If you've made that first step, or you haven't made that first step, and you understand that you're in this same kind of thing, that you're in this prison, and you need help, please see these people in these chairs. Please see me. Please don't leave today saying, man, that is exactly where I am, but just get up and go about your day. You know if the Lord has spoken to your heart today, and you need some help with this, and please 
get help today. I'm going to close this in prayer and turn it over to, to Josh to lead us again in some closing songs. And, uh, and please, again, make your way to these chairs or up here if you need a hand. Lord God, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for your word that's so powerful, that brings freedom, Lord, that destroys every lie that holds us captive, Lord, that destroys the sin and wickedness around us. Help us to recognize the sin and wickedness for it is, for what it is, Lord. Help us to see just how disgusting you think this thing is that destroys us, Lord. Please give us the courage to seek freedom. Please give us the courage to seek you, Lord. Lord God, as we go through the week, just help us to focus on these things. Help us to be changed and transformed by your truth, Lord. Lord, we love you. And we don't love you nearly as much as you love us, Lord. We thank you so much for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.
Bless you all.